Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. There's one exception to this, wherein I was explaining it to Craig. Um, there is that rare occasion where you have a young patient with an incredibly thin gingival crevice, okay? Um, you really can't bury your margin all that well subgingively, okay? So you go ahead, if you will. Now normally we would make our shoulder with a slight bevel on it, okay? Now in this individual, uh, usually they're <laughs> the worst of all possible worlds, okay? They have a very shallow gingival sulcus and when they smile they show all their, their gingival margins okay and you're saying good lord I've got to get metal down there and color stability and the minute I touch that it's going to show through either the metallic color or I'm not going to be able to get the, the, the preparation thick enough and they're going to bleed through so if you have a truly superlative lab person, okay, what you can do is instead of bringing your shoulder out straight, you can really slope your shoulder, okay? Or continue it down and, and make a butt joint, either one, okay? And then your, your lab man goes through and, and builds your, your metal work, only he stops the metal work there. He does not extend the metal across the shoulder area, okay? And then you'll need a, a, a uh, the platinum matrix underneath there, and he'll literally bake this last portion in porcelain, totally unsupported by metal. Okay. Now the advantage there is that you, you've eliminated both problems. You don't have any metal there to show through, um, and also you've got enough thickness to your porcelain for color stability. You don't get the, the bleeding through of the, the opaque, okay? So, in that case, you need to um, that in, in that, whenever you're baking porcelain to a margin is when you need the axillate slant, okay? Now, did you select your shade? No. Okay. What we'll do is we'll go ahead and we'll start on the distal on 22. Okay. okay. We'll start on there first. After you get your rubber dam on any rubber dam, uh, I think your, your extension would be fine from distal of canine to distal of canine. You probably won't even need clamps. Okay. They'll probably hold all by themselves. Uh, let's go ahead and check our shade now. Turn the light off. Keep the, yeah, turn the light down so we have, like, normal light within the operatory and then and you get into practice if you have a skylight that even makes it better because you have more natural light instead of the artificial so you don't end up with orange and, and uh, blue teeth you know for the gators now one thing you'll have going for you in terms of a lingual approach is that you still have a veneer of enamel the natural teeth color uh, in terms of blocking out some of the discoloration. So you'll have a little bit of freedom on your shade. You could probably go and, and use this light gray color, okay? Because that would look real nice in between the teeth. You don't want to have too bright of a, a yellow or a brown color because as you get out toward the mesial and the distal, you have a certain amount of translucency, which makes it a little bit more naturally gray anyway. So if you're going to have a very shallow lesion, you're better off to go with a grayer color, especially at the interproximal, because it'll be more natural. If you put something really yellow right at an interproximal area where you normally have a little bit of gray translucency, then it'll stand out and it won't really be aesthetic. So I think the, the light gray would be a good color for you. And keep your prep conservative, uh, normal dimensions as we had before. Oh, how was it? 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 Oh,
Okay. To that seat solidly, if that seat solidly on those two teeth, uh -huh. it's not a tripod. It, what's going to happen to the side that's on the edentulous ridge? Okay. Uh, you tell me, you the impression. Do you need any space for impression material? We'd like a millimeter okay. to two millimeter. In that case, then you have a solid stop and a solid two, so you have space between dentures reach and the rest of the tray. So you get the impression of the soft tissue under the minimum pressure. That's the purpose of those stops. Yeah. I'm uh, having problems getting anesthesia. I'm doing uh, carbocaine, mm -hmm. one injection now, which is xylocaine. Mm -hmm. I have a uh, distal buckle area. He's uh, still having pain in there. Okay, sometimes you get a coalescence with the cervical plexus. Did you give a long buckle? Oh, no. Give a long buckle. A lot of times that'll knock it out. Okay. If I know why we're pretty well done back there, you know, I don't think it's worthwhile uh, injecting again. But give a long buckle. Sometimes there is a little coalescence in that area there, and that'll take care of it. Okay? Good. What do you think about that? Seems like it's adequate attached to Okay, adequate attached gingiva, but do you think that there's any influence of this causing her teeth to separate? I'm not really sure. Could there be? Yes. The attachment of gingiva? There are muscle fibers that go from here all the way through here, all the way back to the scapula. Okay. And what you're seeing here is as her lip pulls in speech and mastication, mm -hmm. okay, this pulling of these muscles that are incorporated into the dental gingival fiber complex can actually cause a separation medial distally instead of coming more yes. facially. Yes. Okay. Now the reason I. Uh, bring that up is that if she continues to see spacing here, you may want to consider doing a very simple phrenectomy. Okay. Which Would probably attention. should have been done before the ortho. Not this minor ortho, but mm -hmm. the other ortho. Okay. That well, would after twice, I refuse to put braces on her again because mm -hmm. that's just not staying. Well, I think it's that muscle. I think it's the muscle that's keeping them from uh, coming together. The other thing is, you know, don't, you know, you've got your patient there. Use your patient. Say, hey, how about if we do a little lateral excursions? Mm -hmm. Okay, and check them in all directions. Check the protrusive, because quite often you'll get this cusp. You know, for instance, if a patient has a very deep overbite, boy, they, they disclude very, very quickly in the right. posterior, okay? If they don't have such a deep overbite, okay? And they might glide on there. Exactly. And so you, you always want to check to make sure that protrusive is, is not forgotten, okay? And I, I think you're, you're just fine there. Do you understand what I'm saying about the, the relative disclusion right. of the posterior, yeah. depending on the anterior? And well, that, doesn't that, a lot of it have to do with what, what your guidance is, isn't that really? Absolutely. I mean, just straight cusp of guidance. Um, isn't that less a less critical problem, or, or are you going to build in that that bicuspid into your lateral guidance? It depends on what you started out with. Okay, that's true. If that's the true. patient had group function, more than likely you'll restore to group function. Right. Okay. If the patient has cuspid disclusion, thank your lucky stars. Okay. A. <laughs> It's terribly easy to adjust, okay? Uh -huh. <laughs> you know that they're going to touch CO, CR, okay? Uh -huh. And that's all, <laughs> okay? Because everything else is going to disclude. <laughs> Say goodbye, all right? Um, so, uh, in a single restoration, okay, you pretty much restore what they started right. out with, yeah. okay? Very well, sir. And nicely done, I might add. Thank you very much. Both sides, moderate pain, limitation of movement present with clicking, all teeth present, including the third molars, tooth number three, and slight lingual version. So you get a crossbite going on here, huh? 
Okay, it's not uncommon for people that have a crossbite that have, then the next thing you want to look for is to see if you have facets of wear. And you see where you have them? Mm -hmm. So that ties in that you are probably doing what? Bruxing, probably, right? Do you have that down as part of your diagnosis? You don't? Well, did you know that about 70% of the people don't feel that they brux and an awful lot of them do? And one of the things that you look for are the signs and symptoms which indicate bruxin can be Which I've got three out of going five. on. And do you notice the tremendous amount of wear you have on those anterior? One of those also is a rock, which should fatigue. Okay, but you see, there is a lot. Yeah, for, a for a person your age, anterior your anterior. anterior teeth are worn tremendously. With the, with the soft food that we eat in America, there was no way that you would abrade those teeth that far. Now, just because a person do, does have teeth that are abraded like that, is no sign that it, definitely, that it is bruxin, because it could come from something else. It could come from habits, right? It could come from taking, if you had a pipe in your mouth and was chewing sure. on that pipe all the time, that could wear it off. Oh, definitely. If you had been working in the summertime in the carborundum plant somewhere, where there's a lot of, uh, of dust, carborundum dust in the air and so on. But under those circumstances, you usually have a generalized facets of wear rather than just non-functional facets of wear. Now, one of the things that you want to look for when you see these facets of wear, you want to try to match those facets of wear and see if they match, and particularly see if they match in various excursions. You understand? Mm -hmm. Now, if they come together and they match, if those surfaces, as I'm drawing here, if they come together like this, okay, here's a, a central and a lateral, and here's a central maxillary, central right. and maxillary man, uh, mandibular, central and lateral. Now, do you see where the incisal edges come together? It's like a lock and key, or the, the, the juxtaposition is even all the way across. Mm -hmm. If you had something like this where they didn't come together, then you would be highly suspicious that something else had gotten in there, but where they have worn themselves in, they'll come together just like this, and you'll have an even contact all the way across. All right? Good. Now, as we look at yours, the thing that we find, you see how, see how nicely those, those touch? Right there, huh? touch? Mm -hmm. yeah, if that one over there does it, so you got a little bolt. Right, so you've got on yours, you've got two things going on. Mm -hmm. Now, when they did, when your partner did the uh, exam on you, do you have any habits like biting your fingernails? No. Do you chew on pens? No. Did you say you had one that was broken off by a rock? Right there. Is that the one? Yep. Okay, so you see, just because you see a facet of wear, is no sign that it comes from bruxing, and you have to try to get a, this shows you how uh, history is important, how doing a thorough exam is important. You pick things up like this. Now, you still might miss them, but when they don't come together like that, and you can't establish a habit as a cause of it, or some traumatic experience, well, then you're stuck, don't you see? But with the majority, you know, almost 99% of them, you come up with, uh, when they come into close juxtaposition like this, very often when you have that, where the teeth and C, O come together like this, if you look back in here, you will find sometimes where there's the trigger mechanism that may have caused it. They might have been grinding back on here to get rid of this, 
and in doing that, they've worn off the anterior teeth. Uh, do you remember in the textbook, or have you gotten into, um, or oh, there's a German, what's the, what is the um, formula that you have? Telemann, are you familiar with Telemann's no. diagonal rule? Telemann's diagonal rule says that if you have something in the back where the teeth may be hitting prematurely, they very often will do damage to the teeth in the anterior. It's in the textbook. You look under Telemann and you can see an illustration of it and everything. So I would look that up if I were you and get some more information on it than I'm giving you right now. But you see where you have these, uh, this crossbite, you can see where you, where you have facets of wear. You're grinding on those mm -hmm. things. So I would say, I would, I would bet money that you are bruxing at night and you may not even know that you are. You'll get a definite little catch there. Mm -hmm. Were you going to do these from the buckle or from the lingual? I thought from the lingual. That way, and by doing it from the lingual, what benefit will you get then? It's more aesthetic. Definitely. It's not the problem with the margin shown. Mm hmm Okay. So uh, then we need a bonnet check and then a wax? Correct. Wax now, down. please remember how to make the bonnet. You really lubricate your dye, and then you only build half of it. All right. Take it off. Take it off, re-lubricate, and then build the other half. Why, why do you only do one half? You don't lock it on. Right, because it has... You betcha. So there's nothing wrong with that, is there? If we, no. if we guide on two teeth instead of just... Cuspid guidance is a concept. You don't have to have cuspid guidance. It's nice if you have cuspid guidance, but it isn't a necessity. Why do you think that it's nice? to have cuspid guidance. Why would you think it would be nice? Well, it would uh, facilitate the opening of the bite. Um, and the cuspids are generally pretty strong teeth. That's they right. They're down with sound, and they are paired down with That's sound. right. And uh, take out some lateral forces on the posterior teeth. Right. Or maybe reduce some interferences that you might get too. Correct. So you want to be able to take your explorer, mm -hmm. and some people try and do this clearing idea, and I'm finding that a lot of people are getting confused on that. What are you trying to do with that explorer? Well, what's the whole idea of our clearance in there? We want to make sure you have enough room to get a wards carver or something in there to, to okay. clear the amalgam. And later on, what? Floss or whatever. No. Well, not even later floss, on. But Six months or a year from now, what do you want to be able you to want do? You want to be able to check the margins for carries. be able to check the margins for carries. So what you've got to be able to do is get the point of the explorer in there and go tink, tink. Okay. If you can do that, you're extended far enough. Right. Because when you take a radiograph of that with bite wings, it totally blocks the view of that. You can never right. see that area. Right. You never check your condensation or anything. So that's what you're after. And when you get a broad contact like that, sometimes you need to come out a little further just right. so you can get an angle in there and catch it. Okay. okay? But that's all you're trying to do is be able to feel that margin, okay? okay? So that should do it for you. Okay. Now you have to realize there is another problem. You can see going down the root, there's stain going way down there. And we don't want you to extend the prep that far in here. Clinically, would you include that or not? Or as far see as it? the stain down there? Yeah, see it? I would say we'd have to. Yeah, clinically. Clinically, you'd carry it clear to there, which is way overextended in a normal insta instance, okay? Uh, the tooth is solid when you look at it up here, but then when you look at it down there, it has had some attack down further on the root surface. And, you know, so when you get up in junior clinic, they would make you chase that. You'd have a hard time handling your matrix and everything else, okay? But when you look at the prep this way now, it looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. So. It's just really another another area of attack down further on the tooth. Cause why? Chronic inflammation. Right, but when we have fibrotic tissue, what do we know about what happens after you clean his teeth? 
it, you're not going to get as much response. Yeah, right. Well, you, you can just take a wheel step and, okay. uh, and just uh, a angle it a little bit so you have a, 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 that bevel that you're talking about. That's a good idea. Okay. okay. Good. I just think that there's a little radial lucency there on the lateral. I'm not sure how specific you get on the distal there. It just appears to me as though there's a little spot there. Okay, so you feel there is a radial lucency there, okay? Yes. And your diagnosis is what? Previous pulpotomy. Okay, it does have that. Is there another diagnosis? Okay, it would have been curious. Um, okay, an endodontic diagnosis. Sure, okay, there was a curious the, exposure the, at some well, point okay. in time, right? Okay. Is it tender um, to percussion? Yes, it is tender to percussion. Okay, so what would the diagnosis be on that? I would say a chronic... Um, okay, it's tender to percussion. That means okay. you can elicit it now, so that would be acute, right? Acute, okay. Acute um, apical it, right? periodontitis. All right, so you've got acute apical periodontitis. Okay. That's one diagnosis. So you need to make sure that the occlusion is adjusted okay. so that when they go home, they aren't hurting okay. themselves anymore. You've got previous pulpotomy, which means this needs a root canal. Okay. That's the reason it needs a root canal. You also have something else that if this hadn't had a pulpotomy, you'd be using, and what's that? It has an apical Curious. radiolucency. It has it, right? Okay, apical right. radiolucency. What is that called? Okay, it would be, um, well, it would depend on if it were. If um, it's destroyed bone, it's been there for a long time. So okay, we call so it would be a chronic um, apical periodontitis. All right, so you say, wait a minute, chronic apical periodontitis and acute apical periodontitis, how can you have the same? Okay, so it's the same? Exas you have the both of them. Exams. Nope, because there's no swelling, right? Okay, that's right. All right, so you, you diagnose acute apical periodontitis because there is sensitivity to percussion. Okay. You diagnose it chronic apical periodontitis in addition to that because there is a radiolucency. And you need to know that because when you're thinking about doing a root canal, you want to think about an infection, okay. a phoenix abscess. So how do you prevent that? You put them on an antibiotic if you see a big radiolucency. That's a nice small one. So we have to wait and see what we find in there. There's another diagnosis, which is previous pulpotomy, which means I do not need to do pulp tests on this tooth because okay. somebody has already subjected it uh, to the tests that were necessary. And there are no other restorations in the area, so I know which tooth it is. So I don't need to verify that. Okay. Okay. Now, if you're not sure if it's had a pulpotomy, then at that point, yeah. yes, you need to do that. But you can see by the radiograph, and he's also told you, I'm sure, that that's what they've right. done, and we've got the records that say that. Okay. So you've got three diagnoses. This one that you have, previous pulpotomy, does say, yes, you do need the root canal. That's the most important one, but you've got two secondary ones. Okay, I okay? see. That's the main reason I want that is because a couple other people said they've been in the same right. thing, and so I, right. I want to get Different instructors you know, will I, ask different things of you. What I want you to do is understand all of it. You've written down the most important one, and that's good. Okay. okay? But what I want, I want you to understand all the rest of it because there are subtle things you need to do, such as adjust the occlusion and think about an antibiotic. Okay. okay? And depending upon what we have left, uh, it might be more than just a, a post sliding in there. We might have to do something about... Yeah, that's what I want to ask you. Do you want me to basically slice the tooth down to right there? No. You don't want... I would rough prepare it first just to see what we've got going for us right. before you cut it off because I like to keep as much tooth structure intact as I could. Okay. Okay? Am I, I going to do it today or should I just do the post and core today? Well, I'll clean it out first, and uh, then I'd rough repair it. Okay. Now, as far as width of shoulder, excellent, beautiful, very nice bevel. Okay. Great definition of shoulder ending and the blending of the the chamfer. The one thing I was concerned about is the, is the lingual the lingual wall there. Is that especially the distal lingual a little yeah. over tapered? A little over tapered and. And I was wondering if it, I, I lengthen a little bit towards the mesial. It is gets it a little short? It gets a little short. Okay. But that's a problem with mandibular buys, mm -hmm. okay? <clears throat> they really have kind of somebody. There. A mandibular buy, don't you know? Remember, it, it's almost like a cuspid. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got that huge bump of cusp and then the little diminutive lingual cusp, okay? And, Lord, it gets tough sometimes to get length. 
because you need the length of this wall against this yeah. wall for retentive quality. Okay. And it gets tough. Does that run into problems? Yeah. That's close. Yeah, that's close. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's bad enough. You may have to go to a, an alternative retentive form like uh, Did you ever put a box pins? or put a, um, um, grooves in this at all? Sure yeah. would. They haven't mentioned sure it at all. Would. Absolutely. That Again, that, that's to to enhance your retentive form, okay? Yeah, right. nothing wrong with, with dropping boxes or an occlusal uh, isthmus either, okay? I would think something like an occlusal isthmus went in there. Something because like don't that. forget, by doing that, you're not only creating more walls that can be parallel to each other for retentive quality, you're also increasing surface area for the looting ability between your crown and the tooth itself, okay? So, yeah. Um, and, and this is what we were trying to do. You know, we, we can't have you cut every prep in the world. And I keep saying, I think that's the beauty of in education. You know, hopefully, we're going to, to teach you universal concepts uh, so that you may run across a case that, good Lord, I've never seen anything like this. Well, so what? You still apply the basic concepts. You know, you can think. One other thing is uh, I'm going to do the phase one evaluation next Friday. You know, on here. Mm -hmm. and, um, but I haven't done any you know, operative one because it's, you know, he's been doing that bridge, so that doesn't make any difference, does nope. it? No. Okay. No. Uh, when you, if you have lesions or restorations that are encroaching on the gingiva, it would be important. Uh -huh. But in his case, that's not true. Okay. Another thing is, um, when I'm doing the phase one, mm -hmm. um, does, does all his previous um, perio work that he's had done all come into the phase one evaluation? Like, because he's already had a phase one and a phase two evaluation, mm -hmm. and then this is like starting all over again. But do I go all the way back from... You should have a working knowledge of what's been happening in the past. Mm -hmm what his therapy has been, and what his track record has been. Mm -hmm. But to be, to really be honest and be objective, you should really be looking at um, just your work. Okay. Just your work. Okay. I wasn't okay, sure because he's got piles of... Yeah. Well, what are we going to do about the tooth behind it? Remaining. 18? Yeah. Remaining. We haven't we decided yet. Okay, because there, you know, there's some frank carries right here. Right. Obviously, and some carries in the other areas. Uh, well, I wouldn't let that go too long. If we got a little bit of time along the way, maybe we could clean some of the decay out and then at least, well, I put something a little more substantial in there, maybe a little bit of amalgam, cut a little undercut dovetail or something and just put in a temporary amalgam. I can't give you any credit for her. Right, uh, and we can't, you know, we won't charge her for anything, but at least it'll stop that decay, okay? There's something that's very interesting here. Let me show you something about subgingival margins versus supergingival margins, okay? Look at the health of this. Mm -hmm. Look at the health of this. Okay, completely different. Completely different, sure. isn't it? Completely different. Mm -hmm. Now, what that tells me is any time you can get away with a margin that is not in the gingiva, that's what you ought to do. Okay. Because look at that. In sure. fact, this part right here is really healthier than that part. Let's see, let's see the further we go back? That would be uncommon, though, would it? I would feel it's probably a little more easier to clean up there than it would on But so you see this margin here is approaching being super gingival. I and see. this one is really tucked in gingival. Okay.
Okay, let me show you with the handpiece how I would do that, okay? You'd run it dry, because we're not going to cause heat, because we're running a so low in RPM, minimum pressure, and we're going to be on, off, on, off, on, off, so I mean, we won't have that much. See the angle I've got it at right there? See, what that does is that reinsures us that we've got nothing but clean, uh, uncontaminated enamel rods available for our etching. Otherwise, if we get hydroxylene on it and we just go back with a hand instrument, we may leave uh, pieces of calcium hydroxide that'll interfere or act as a water-soluble gasket between the bonding agent and the uh, restored material, or the tooth. You can go ahead and do the same then for 23. Just a little slight bevel all the way around. Usually, if we have enough access, we'll go with a round diamond, which will give us like a chamfer, but you don't have enough access here. So we'll have to do the best we can and, and use the, this thin diamond and we'll formulate like a bevel. Go ahead, do that, and then etch, then rinse and dry. Should I etch both of them? No, because what will happen, you probably contaminate when you're manipulating. So we'll do each one individually now, okay? First of all, I like to hold the lip with a gauze, because I can hold a slippery lip better with a gauze than just with my finger, okay? And then the other technique is to pull the tissue over the needle, okay? Rather than, now, if you give me the, the syringe here, I'll show you what I'm talking about. I like to use a, a short needle also for max slurry, don't I? Now, now watch what I'm doing here. I'm to, this, you're not gonna feel this, but I'd lay the needle right there. See that? See, if you're coming in like this, you have no, you have no control at all. So it's just kind of wavering in the breeze here. But now watch it, I lay it right like this. And then, and then I squeeze the tissue and pull it over the needle like that, see? It's in. And then when I'm injecting, then I, what I do is I, I go like this and I just kind of roll the tissue like that. You see, I'm, I'm kind of just squeezing it and just kind of rocking it like that as I inject. Now that slight pressure takes her mind off of the solution going in, you see. You don't have to squeeze hard to give her a bruise, but just kind of roll it like that. And she's feeling me do that and she doesn't feel, the, and, you, and you inject slowly, see. And then when you're done, you give it a little bit of a squeeze and pull it out and she won't feel it at all, and she won't even feel the solution going in, see? You're defining that corner. I'm doing all your work for you. I'm <laughs> gonna quit at this. Go ahead and, and y'all have you remove that, okay? And mm -hmm. define that wall, and then go ahead and, and double check your prep, put your retentive grooves in, and then let me see it. Okay. Okay. Okay, now. I want to have you draw me a quick little picture on these, right here. If you've got, we'll do an upper tooth. This is a section on it, all right, of an MOD, okay? Then normally the rest of the tooth would be in there like that, and we've sectioned it. Now, got a retentive groove here and here. Now, what are you going to do with a marginal trimmer? You draw on there what you do with a marginal trimmer are you for saying me. this is the cervical right here? Yeah, these are the cervical boxes, okay? where you've dropped the box at this point. If we were to put this model vertical here, this is your axial wall and this is your cervical floor and this is the outside of the tooth. And this area is the area that you're saying is rough to me right now. So oh. what do you do with a marginal trimmer on that? What I usually do is like go from, uh, go toward the, the walls on each side, start in the middle and go that way there. Because if I start over here, you get too much curve. Okay. So this way, if you, if you put it into that now, way, that, that isn't looking at it this way, it's looking at it this way. I've cut the tooth across here, <clears throat> okay? And what are you going to do to that floor? What's the whole idea of the marginal trimmer on that floor? Basically, to get more of a perpendicular edge, take off the, edge, the rougher edges. 
Yeah, but not perpendicular. Aren't you trying to bevel it this way? Isn't oh, yeah, the this, the isn't this, this little line they're showing right there? See, yeah. it's, it's a little angle. Now, position your instruments, and you got two here. If you're working from the front of the mouth, which one is going to work on that distal? I would say this one right over here. I always, I always looked at it as having a sharper point out toward okay. the Okay. Now take the other instrument and put it on there. And position yourself like you're coming from the top of the tooth now, just like you're doing. And now see how it puts a bevel on there for you? Okay. That's the way you want to do in the tooth. And you start on the buckle and go all the way to the lingual with one sweeping action. Now, you can use it like a hatchet. You can come right up here and come down on that wall a little bit into that corner and take the sharpness out of that corner, okay? Mm -hmm. But obviously, you aren't, this is for the other side of the tooth. You can't get this one in position, okay? Mm -hmm. So, if we put this in here, it's a sweep that way, see it? And you can go in on your wall. And then this one would be a sweep up. See it break some of it off too? It actually shattered some there. That really that kind of a rough spot. See it's gone now, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So you need to plane that just a little more with your marginal trimmer. Get your retentive groove and then we'll take a look at it. Okay? Thank you. Do you have some floss? Okay, first, let's just get it, get it stabilized. Okay, and now let's put the frame on. So the next thing we'll do, okay? We can go right to this frame right now. Okay, you stretch this side. Don't put a lot of tension on it because you may Pull your clamp, and we don't want to do that. And we haven't accomplished anything. And I'll stretch your side. Okay, and we can fold this under, then pull up some of your slack. And now you've got it under control where you can go ahead and, and get it through each individual contact a lot easier, okay? It's a lot easier than trying to look for each little piece, isn't it? You feel a little bit of pressure here in between these teeth. Okay. And just get, make sure everything is down and then invert and then remove your IRM and then call me over and let me take a look. Boy, access is really tough yeah. there. I think we ought to try to extend that just a little bit more yet. Okay. And you're probably going to have to just take a round burr and, and set it back in there and then back it off and start it rotating and then come in contact and let's extend it slowly okay. towards the buckle a little farther and see if we can get that to be a little more sound there. I'm afraid we're going to have, we don't have it all out. What you probably ought to do, <laughs> that's right, what you probably ought to do is put, is sequence them out and put the three fours here, put your detection things here, put your universals here, put your uh, files here, and then just uh, there you go. Some people. Some people starting out will actually put the numbers. Yeah, that's where I had to have it going like that. Oh. At first. <laughs> you know, just, good. I want to get the cement for that trivia.
everything. If everything's done, no more than oh, 20 minutes. So we've got to be ready to cement by you got a good solid half hour. Okay, so keep an eye on your time. And so it's sweeping up. See, even though I ran that hatchet through there, it still didn't do the job that the marginal trimmer right. did. And see, even that little top corner, I can still catch a little and work it up there. Okay. Um, I think you're basically ready to, why don't you try the marginal trimmer on just to get the feel of it. And you saw how I was doing it. I was doing a palm and oh, thumb again. Okay. I don't know. I, I did the marginal trimmer already. Maybe it didn't seem like I did. I thought I was in there. Okay. Well, I'm going to, I'll watch you on it and we'll see what you got. And then we'll be ready to get a matrix on it. I want you to evaluate it first. You sit down and try the marginal trimmer on it. Let me just see what you're doing with it. <clears throat> now, myself, I find that, okay, try it that way for just a second, okay? Now, you've basically got the spot you want. Now, come down that in, incisal edge like I did. Now, bring it out, tip it a little bit this way. Oh, you want me to go down that? And then go down that edge, yeah. Okay. And so you need to change your angle. Now, a little hard to get your hand down far enough, isn't it? Yeah, Why don't it you try a palm and thumb grasp on it? Okay. Just go to palm and thumb. Now, that lets you get down lower, doesn't it? Okay. And you can sweep. It's a little awkward because you haven't used it. You should get down where you've got your thumb on the teeth. Curl your thumb up. There you go. That's your rest. Okay? You've got to get a rest. No matter what you do, there has to be a rest on it. Okay? And then it's, it's a rolling action with that, just like you're doing with your fingers, okay? And then the other side would go for your lingual, wouldn't it? Okay? okay. Not quite such a prying action, more of a scraping. There you go. Okay. Okay. And then feel your retention in, in both because your cervical is appropriate, your incisal is a little overdone. And then I want you to go ahead and evaluate it all the way through on the criteria. And then let's see what you've got, okay? And then we'll talk it over. I'll have to reevaluate some of the things that. Yeah, right. Well, evaluate it as it is now, not okay. as it was, but as it is, okay? And then we'll talk that over. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You know, all the way down. Go, yeah, just use it. I can explore all the way down. That's good. Yeah. Feel it now? There you go. Now, right, replane that a little bit and then open the blade out a little bit by. Okay, it's real close there. See how the facial mm -hmm. surface? Right, do it this way. Turn it and then. Mm. There you go. Okay. This this is the opposite motion. Remember this one? Mm-hmm. There you go. So that keeps you from closing it down. Mm-hmm. That's good. Okay. In I'm exaggerate. taking the clamp a little bit and some right. movement. So if I just come in straight kind of and try to lay what, into it a little. Yes. Or you, what you might find is helpful too is if you remember back when we did Cohesive gold, we used a uh, 212 clamp. We always used a straight hand piece to prepare that class five. Oh, yeah. For, the reason, oh, yeah. for that reason, because you end up bumping the clamp with a contra angle. So if you, if you find that you can't get it one area and you want to take a, if you got a straight hand piece round bird, just okay. find that might be a little easier to Great. place your attention. Okay, good. good. We'll give you a CR on that. <laughs> All right, or four, excuse me. Yeah. The most of it. A couple of these got that lean overted too, and mm -hmm. the one that's severely broken down, so I was kind of hesitant and forced my way around there. Okay. Okay, sir. Yes. You have your turn to get that. Next one. Okay, there's, you're right. This, you got your work cut out for you because of the, the teeth in their position. Here, it's going to give you some very strange embrasure spaces. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that right there, on the, I'm on the distal lingual line angle of that um, mm -hmm. 
molar, and I can feel just a little bit of, uh, of something there. And I'm on the mesial line angle of this one, and there's a little bit of roughness. All right. Mm -hmm. that little noise there? Okay, open for me just a little wider. There you go. Let me show you something. Let me show you something. Here. Oh, okay. Good. Excellent. That's probably what happened to them. Yep, here they are. Let me show you a couple of things here. All right. Let's see. Where are we getting myself? Let me show you one. I want to get to one area that is really quite significant. There we go. I want you to take the explorer and on the mesial lingual of 44, I want you to start out the outside where you can see it. And I want you to go up and down very slowly going inside. Well, okay, now here's what we need to do then. Can you bring your chin down a little bit for me? Okay. Okay. Now, that one, that little bit kind of helped, didn't it? out towards the mesial. Is that what you're mentioning? Mm -hmm. There's a huge piece of subgingival calculus right in there. In fact, it is so large, you might think it's part of the tooth. That's right. It's felt like a contour almost. It goes right into the contour. That's right. So let's take your 1112. Okay, now let's make it easier on you. Have him turn towards you. Okay. Now, unfortunately, the 1112 is not a very efficient curette in the mandible. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to work real well on your hands. Okay. That's right. And, uh, you know, just feeling it, you know, it's easier to get there because you want to move. Yeah, but I can hear it. Yeah, I'll just move back a little bit. Okay. Now, try moving it in like we were doing before. Try moving it into the contact a little bit more. Okay. And go up yeah. under, really try to go up under that piece and pull it out. How you doing? Think, think that you're wedged in there, maybe? In yeah, the contact? Okay. Let's make, let me have a take a look at it. Now, let's see what I do that's different from what you're doing as far as. Okay, first of all, I'm having him turn his head more. Okay. Yeah. And open just a little wider for me. And you're right, this is a very difficult area to work in. Because you see, you have, don't have a lot of room to move. And the tooth is positioned, okay? So it's not an easy area for anyone to work in. Okay. So there's one other possibility. You were at seven. Now. There you go. 
Yeah, now you look good. And then you're able to see what you're trying to do. And I think you've got it. What you probably ought to do. <laughs> That's right. What you probably ought to do is put, is sequence them out and put the three fours here, put your detection things here, put your universals here, put your uh, files here, and then just uh, there you go. Oh, some people, out. some people starting out will actually put the numbers. Yeah, that's where I had to have it going like that oh. at first. <laughs> you know, just, Good. All heck's working loose sense. Slowly go up and down. Very light touch. That's excellent. That's excellent. That's the way it's supposed to feel. And you're right, you're hitting the contact. That's the way it's supposed to feel. Um we have the same situation on the molars. Mm -hmm. What I would advise, since we have done quadrants one and two now, I would hold. I would stop mm -hmm. and come back and let's do three and four next time. Okay. okay. Start and, and, uh, and just do the entire mandible. You've gotten a fair amount of the gross debridement on this quadrant. Uh, but there's still a fair amount. Mm -hmm. The time that it took you to do that one is going to take you at least that amount of time on those molars back here. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the rest of it mm -hmm. looks something like that, too. All right. Would you want a quick demonstration on those vials? Okay. Have? Yes. In fact, that area that we were working in is, in is an excellent place. The files come in several... Uh, different kinds of angulations, and you can almost use your ingenuity here, for instance, where we were working before. Well, let me show you, let me show you first of all how they go into the sulcus. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they're composed of, like, your curette has one blade. These have three. Mm -hmm. And so what you... on a pull stroke? That's so. right. They're excellent for the straight and buckle and lingual. Mm -hmm. See that's how they can go in the side? They're also excellent for inaccessible areas. So here, open a little wider for me. See what I'd be doing? Mm -hmm. okay. And there is an instrument for sharpening them that should be in your kit. Mm -hmm. It's a very small triangular instrument for it's sharpening. Like a file almost that's right. Small file. And here's what you do with them. Now the others, this is the one that I use most of the time because it's a contra-angle. This one can be used, for instance, like this. Uh, that seems like that would be a lot easier than the curette so much. Especially on the straight and buckle yeah, and I mean, right where you were, yes. like that. Okay, let's do that. Okay, so let's, uh, one and two are complete, mm -hmm. three is incomplete, and uh, we'll finish them up next time. Okay. the progress. Hi. Hello. How are you doing today? Good. You're a veteran of, of our clinics. You spend many hours here. You know this patient? Oh, yes. <laughs> you got a check for me, too? Not <laughs> today. Is that a nice chair? Well, it's got, it it, yeah. it's got a cushiony effect to it. So how's, how's the temporary been feeling? Been Temporary's good. been okay? Mm -hmm. okay. Were you out at Cedar Key about 
three weeks ago, four weeks ago, yeah. on a Sunday. We were with some other people, I think, because I, my wife and my son and I were over there for the weekend. We were out in the fishing pier, and somebody looked very familiar, yeah. like you. Yes, it would have been. Yes, huh? I put my sister down there. Okay, mm -hmm. that was it then. We stayed in those real high buildings, those mm -hmm. new ones during the windstorm, and I thought the thing was going to fall over. <laughs> I was about ready to leave and come home. Hold it. Just keep your teeth together. So, the thing we're going to do is that outstanding excess of prematurity, we're going to... Boy, that muscle is going crazy. That right? muscle is really bothering? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very it's often, like that's, that's one of the problems that goes on. And um, when I wake up in the morning with the bite split, I am holding my teeth tight. Clenched together tightly? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just a hold for just a minute, please. Notice that we're taking the distal slope of the lower. And we're going to take this mesoslope. slope. You can see because of the shiny facet on there. Mm -hmm that she's really been grinding on that thing. She's smoothed that muscle, that she smoothed that enamel surface right off and made it shiny. Now let's just close again. Do you notice any difference? Mm-hmm. What difference do you notice? It's, it's hitting the back teeth instead of that tooth. It's hitting the back teeth now, huh? Mm-hmm. Do you notice any difference in this muscle up here? Yeah. What do you notice difference in the muscle? It's not, I don't know how to explain it other than it's not hitting and not uncomfortable. It's not as uncomfortable? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. What do you think about that, Dr. Kim? <laughs> Very quick response. <laughs> huh? Do you think that's a placebo effect? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> do you? Think it's a no, not necessarily, and because I've seen this happen so many times before. Now just close your teeth together again. What do you notice now? Well, they seem like they fit a little bit better. The muscle is still tight right there, though, from opening. And right, we, that muscle has been that way, and that you've had for so long. Uh, just doing this isn't going to relieve it completely, but. Very often, the patients will notice a difference. I do. But I wanted an unsolicited statement from you on the effect that it did feel. It does feel better. Mm -hmm. You see, you're not wearing this all day. You're going all day long with these teeth striking. You understand? She's just wearing this at night. What sort that of work do you like do? It feels like it hits, too, though. I don't okay. Know. Um, bookkeeping, adding machine, a, a desk job. Mm -hmm. Do you find it stressful work at all, or is um, or what? No. You don't? Mm -mm. Boring? You find it boring? Yeah. You do? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought was that maybe when they did it, they just did it out of the clear. Of course, then you have an anterior bite, so, I mean, those would eventually bite. Wear down. Oh, you mean when they put the bridges in, they put them in shy of occlusion, and the anterior is wore down to that level? <laughs> when they put the bridges in at first, were you biting on them? I don't know. Uh, yeah. When I put uh, my bridges what? Okay. When you had the bridges put in, uh -huh. when they first made them for you, were they touching upper teeth against bottom teeth? Uh, some, yeah. Some Somewhat. Animation, but I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Where were you doing most of your chewing, in the back or in the front? I could say the most I chewing than my gun. You might have something there. You might have something there.
Well, we can't do anything about it now. I mean, from the standpoint, we can't place those margins uh, super. So there's a couple of tricks that we might consider doing with her for our plant control in those areas. And one is something maybe like a rubber tip stimulator. Okay, I was also showing her also use the, the Norwegian wood that the Norwegian sticks in. Yes, the that would be good. That would be good. But have her just trace those margins. Okay. okay. We might want to keep those distal walls where we've got them to help hold the temporary in. We don't want to rush an amalgam and not get a real nice okay. result. Okay, copalite, copalite, okay, because we've gone pretty well here. Copalite, excavate at the gingival so we know what our carry situation is. Then go back up to the mesial, and I'd work low speed without the water spray. See how that works? On the mesial? On the mesial, okay, low speed. Maybe even hand instrument it and see how that works to decrease the chance okay. of sensitivity. Okay. And then just let me know, we'll monitor. Okay. We'd like to get that restored today if yeah, we I'd could, like to save her another appointment. But we want to be comfortable too. I'm listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.